Hello, I'm Tina Zhang and I'm going to talk about classical proofs of quantum knowledge. This was joint work with Thomas Vedic at Caltech. So this is the rough outline of the presentation, it's also the rough outline of the paper. And in this paper we're interested in defining classical proofs of quantum knowledge. Um, so many of you might be familiar with proofs of knowledge in the purely classical setting. Um, here we're interested in looking at versions of proofs of knowledge where the verifier is classical, um, but the witness is a quantum state and not a classical string. So after we define these objects, we're going to show some properties of the definition, which have simple proofs. And then finally, we want to show an example that instantiates the definition. Okay, so here's the canonical setup in the, the classical setting. Uh, there is a prover P um, who wants to prove to a verify V that it knows a secret key some publicly known public encryption key, PK, such that PKSK is valid. And how do we formalize the notion that the tuple PKSK is valid? Um, the answer usually is that there's a public MP relation, R, which takes in instance witness pairs and checks that the witness W is indeed a witness for the instance X. So we encode the public key as the instance X and we encode the secret key as the witness. So in this case, the instance is a graph, the witness, I've chosen three colorings, so the witness is a coloring of the graph um, that only uses three colors such that no edge has two endpoints of the same color. So this encoding makes sense in the context of typical classical public key encryption schemes, such as, you know, this is an example using Diffie-Hellman. Um, hopefully it's clear why this encoding is, is a natural one in the, in the case of this particular application. So this is the general setup, um, but what is a proof of knowledge? So it's a protocol between the prover and the verifier. Intuitively it has a security property that the verifier accepts if and only if the prover really does know W, the witness, and we'll formalize what it means for the prover to know W in a second. So this protocol can be trivial if we're not concerned about zero knowledge, you know, the prover can just send this witness to the verifier. But if we do want to hide the secret key from the verifier, then we might have something a bit more involved here. Okay, so now let's formalize what it means to say that the prover really does know W. So this is a basic setup. There's an efficient machine called the extractor, um, whose job it is to compute W. And the prover is modeled as a black box, so the extractor only gets to test its input-output behavior. However, the extractor gets to rewind the prover if it wants, so it can re replay one of the rounds with a different message, for example, and see what the prover does under the new circumstances. So this is to give it more power for, um, than the, the real verifier. So if the protocol is zero knowledge, you don't want the real verifier computing the witness, which is what the extractor is supposed to be doing. So if, after interacting with the prover P uh, for a polynomial number of steps and doing polynomial additional computation, the extractor can output the witness, then we say that P knew the witness because it was able to pull um, it was possible to pull the witness out of the prover efficiently. So just a couple of quick remarks, you know, classical proofs of knowledge are useful as building blocks in many other protocols, such as identification protocols, signatures, and CCA secure encryption. And they have been considered and proven secure in the post-quantum setting. So for example, see 2012 Unruh's paper. Um, our focus here is different. We want to look at proving quantum knowledge, not just post-quantum security. So I'll make some more remarks about that shortly. Uh, but basically it means that the witness will be a quantum state instead of a classical string. Okay, so now we want to look at how we want to, to define classical proofs of quantum knowledge. Um, so the first application we might think of for something called a proof of quantum knowledge is proving knowledge for a QMA witness. So QMA is the quantum analog of NP. If NP is a class of problems that can be efficiently checked by a classical verifier given a classical string as witness, QMA is a class of problems that can be efficiently checked by a quantum verifier, given a quantum state as witness. So how would we go about letting the prover prove that it knows a witness to some instance of a QMA complete problem? In other words, how do we translate the MP primitives to the quantum setting? So the first step, of course, is to replace the classical witness string with a quantum state row, that's the witness that the prover wants to prove knowledge of. We also need to replace the instance of the MP complete problem, as I used three coloring in my earlier pictures, with an instance of a QMA complete problem. So for example, this can be a local Hamiltonian. Um, and finally, we need to replace the MP relation 
which checked whether witness instance pairs were actually valid uh, with, with a so-called QMA relation. So it's basically a quantum circuit that performs the same function as the classical relation R, takes in an instance, a witness has input and it outputs whether or not the X or O pair is valid. So a few remarks about proving knowledge for QMA witnesses. Um, again, the situation is not to be confused with uh, post-quantum proofs of classical knowledge. Uh, there you want to prove knowledge of a classical string, but consider potentially cheating quantum provers and verifiers. Um, here we're proving knowledge of a quantum state. Um, one remark is that there is no longer a trivial non-zero knowledge protocol to prove knowledge of a QMA witness if we restrict to classical communication, which is what we're interested in doing in this paper. So of course, if we allow quantum communication, the prover can just send the witness as before, but with classical communication, it's not easy to see how this could be done. And the last remark, um, for this application, we basically just went and translated all of the MP primitives to their direct equivalents in the quantum setting, but we might want also to look at scenarios which are more uniquely quantum, and we'll look at these one of these now. So here's a second application we looked at in this paper. Uh, in this situation, we have a quantum money scheme and the prover wants to prove that it has a quantum money state. So just in case you haven't seen quantum money before, so we have an all-powerful trusted entity called the bank, which mints banknotes that are quantum states. And we imagine that the bank gives a banknote state to the prover, um, for example, as interest on the prover's savings. And some time passes, and then the prover comes back and wants to spend that banknote. And the bank wants to verify that the banknote that the prover hands in is legitimate. So it wants to know that the prover hasn't tampered with the banknote or tried to counterfeit one, to forge one. So they execute a protocol in which, loosely speaking, the prover proves to the bank that it, quote marks, has the banknote which was given to it before. So often this protocol is really just, you know, one round where the prover sends the banknote and then the bank applies some quantum measurement to it and accepts if the measurement accepts. But we'd also like to consider in this paper protocols which only involve classical communication in order to verify these banknotes. So why does the banknote have to be a quantum state? Because we want to exploit no cloning to make uncounterfeitable money. So if the banknote were a classical string, the prover could just copy the string endlessly. And unless the bank remembers every interaction that it's ever had, the prover could cheat and spend more money than it's meant to have. But quantum states can't be easily copied, so we can design a scheme such that after being given one banknote, um, let's say of n qubits, um, P, the prover, can pass once in the verification protocol here, but it cannot produce any two n qubit states such that two copies of verification applied to the first n and the last n qubits respectively by the bank um, will both pass verification. So here's an example of such a scheme to make things concrete. It was invented by Wiesner in 1983. A banknote is an n qubit state. Each qubit of that n qubit state is drawn uniformly at random from the set 0, 1, plus and minus. Question, how would the bank make such a state? Well, one way would be to write down some random classical string X and then apply Hardeman gate with, to each qubit with half probability. To verify this banknote, the bank would need to remember the qubits to which it applied Hadamards. Then it would unapply the Hadamards that it applied and measure in the standard basis and then check that the classical string that it got was X. So with this verification procedure, the maximum probability that the prover can prove, uh, produce two n qubits such that the first n and last n qubits independently pass verification, this verification procedure we just described, um, is three quarters to the n. This was shown uh, in 2012 by, I think, Watrous et al. Okay, so that's a relatively interesting situation where we have a prover wanting to prove in some sense that it knows or has a quantum state. And we already saw one way to generalize the classical notion of proofs of knowledge to the quantum setting. Does this situation, this quantum money situation, fit into that formalism? So it turns out that for any Wiesner money state, for example, we can write down an instance X of a QMA complete problem, such as local Hamiltonian, and a QMA relation such that, you know, um, Q of X and the money state equals one if and only if the dollar state really is the money state. However, if we were to then publicly disseminate X, the instance, and Q, this relation, this would break the security of the scheme. So basically, X and Q would tell you the qubits to which the bank had applied Hadamard's um, in the Wiesner example. Um, and given that knowledge, it's quite easy to counterfeit a Wiesner money state. So on the other hand, if we don't make its X and Q publicly known, it's not even clear what the prover should be proving knowledge of. You might say at this point, okay, why don't we have an oracle or something to make it well-defined without giving out the secret information? 
uh, but that's not allowed in the canonical QMA formalism, and the, in there the instance and the relation are supposed to be publicly known. So basically, in order to make our definition of a proof of knowledge broad enough to capture both quantum money and QMA, we borrow a formalism called the agree and prove formalism. I won't dwell on this um, in the interest of time, but it was invented by Badercher, Jost, and Maurer in order to capture in the classical setting situations that don't fit neatly into the empty formalism. And this framework turns out to work nicely as well for our purposes here. Okay, so we want to broaden our definition of a proof of knowledge because crypto in the quantum setting might involve new tasks that aren't well captured by a direct translation of the MP formalism. That's the first issue surrounding translating the idea of proof of knowledge to the setting where the witness is a quantum state. There's also a subtlety surrounding defining black box access to the prover when the prover is quantum but only outputs classical information. So if we only let the extractor look at classical transcripts, the question is how will it get a quantum witness out? That seems as hard as quantum state tomography, which is hard, which in general requires exponential, um, an ex exponential number of measurements on the state. So we must allow some sort of quantum access to the prover. And we use a solution to this problem that's similar to solutions which were considered in um, Bunru 2012, also Watrous 2009. Um, and, but we use this definition in ways that were allowed in both these definitions before, but not completely explored. So I'll go over the definition so that we all have the model clear. So here's how we model the prover in this definition. We consider it to consist of a private register uh, in which it can put any quantum state it likes and a message register, um, which is used for exchanging messages with the verifier. So we'll see how in a second. Uh, we assume the prover's private register is initialized to some arbitrary state and that the message register starts off initialized to zero. So how does interaction work? We assume that the prover is entirely characterized by a unitary operation, u sub p, which it applies in every round. So let's say the protocol starts now and that the prover sends the first message. The first thing that happens is that the prover applies u sub p and it acts on both the private and the message register. It could be entangling these, whatever. After u sub p is applied, some trusted party measures the message register in the computational basis. This results in a classical string, um, and that's the message that the prover sends the verifier. So then the verifier processes this message and puts the message that it sends back to the prover in the message register, replacing the message that was there after the measurement um, here. And then we apply use of p again and measure again in order to get the next prover message, etc. Okay, so here's how p would be available to the extractor. So p starts out initialized the way it would be in the real protocol. The extractor can read and write arbitrary quantum states to the message register, but cannot access the prover's private register. And that's the justification for our black box terminology. Um, however, the extractor can command the prover to do one or two things, apply use of p controlled on some state which the extractor provides, or apply use of p dagger, again, controlled. Um, so this is the analog of rewinding since use of p dagger is the inverse operation of use of p. And note that both these unitaries act on the private and the message register, so the extractor never gets to see the private register, but it can act on it indirectly through use of p. And it can also put an arbitrary state in the message register, and doesn't need to be a classical string. So the classical verifier would only ever put a classical string there, but the extractor can put anything. So this possibility was allowed in previous works, uh, but not really used. And as far as I know, this is the first time anyone actually uses this capability in a meaningful way uh, in a proof of security. So that's what I was referring to earlier. Um, as before, we expect the ex extractor to output the witness state at the end of the interaction. Okay, so that's basically it for the definition of a classical proof of quantum knowledge. And we've defined black box access in a meaningful way, and we've expanded our setup a bit to allow for more flexible interactions between prover and verifier in order to capture quantum money as well as QMA. So one of the things we do in this paper is prove some simple properties of classical proofs of quantum knowledge as defined in this way. And I won't dwell on this in the interest of time, but uh, I will describe them briefly. So the first one is, if a classical non-destructive proof of knowledge exists um, for a witness state, then the witness state can be cloned by an unbounded adversary. So non-destructive here just means that the witness state is not damaged by the protocol, and the protocol can be run an arbitrary number of times without the prover having to produce fresh witness states. So this has consequences in the quantum money setting because a lot of quantum money protocols are information theoretically secure. Um, 
Specifically, it means set non-destructive and also non-interactive classical protocols for proving knowledge of quantum money states can't exist. The second property um, might be somewhat expected that if you can show a proof of knowledge under our definition, then it is also a, a quantum money verification procedure. So a quantum money verification procedure, remember, says that you can't pass twice if you only have one money state. The proof of knowledge says that if you can pass even once, then it's possible to efficiently compute a witness state from you. So this lemma just for formalizes the intuition that the proof of knowledge is stronger than the quantum money verification procedure with, with some loss in parameters. Okay, so now we come to an example. So we've settled on a definition, we've proven some properties that it has, but we want to show that there are actually protocols which instantiate the definition. We also want to explore the kinds of techniques that might be useful for analyzing protocols that we want to show are proofs of quantum knowledge. So um, we, we show several examples in the paper, but I'm just going to go through one of them. So let's recall reasons quantum money, the money states look like this in Cupid's song. I'm going to introduce some notation that will be useful. So remember earlier we said a visa state can be generated by the bank if it selects some classical string X uniformly at random, and then applies a Hadamard to each qubit with half probability. So this is just saying, you know, the string X chosen uniformly at random, and then there's a th string theta which encodes the qubits which had Hadamards applied to them. And if the bit, if the ith bit of theta is one, then that qubit had a Hadamard applied, otherwise it did not. And x and theta completely specify the visa state in terms of classical strings, so the bank can keep these strings around to verify the dollar state when it needs to do that. Okay, so now let's look at a protocol which might, we think, might be a proof of quantum knowledge for a visa money state. So the verifier issues a challenge to the prover, which is a uniformly random string, C. Um, it's n bits long. And then the honest prover does the following, it simply measures the visa state in the basis determined by C, where I mean that if the ith bit of C is zero, it measures in the computational basis, otherwise it measures in the Hadamard basis. And then the verifier checks that whenever the ith bit of C is equal to the ith bit of theta, the ith bit of the prover's response is equal to x sub i. So note that the honest prover gets deterministic measurement outcomes x sub i um, exactly for the ith qubit if C sub i is equal to theta sub i, and otherwise it gets random outcomes, um, uniformly at random because c sub i is equal to theta sub i, it's just saying that the prover measured the ith qubit in the so-called correct basis, the, be, uh, the basis that the bank prepared that qubit in. And otherwise it measures in a basis that's rotated, so it gets a random outcome. So given that information, hopefully it, the verifier's check makes sense. Okay, so how do we prove that this protocol is a proof of quantum knowledge? I'm going to describe a thought experiment here. We're going to eventually relate the thought experiment to the real protocol in a way that says something about the real protocol. Um, so let's rename our parties first of all. Let's call the bank Alice, and let's call the prover Bob. And recall, in the real protocol, Alice generates two strings, theta and x, uniformly at random, and then she constructs the Wiesner money state from them according to the formula we described on an earlier slide, this one. And then she sends the money state to Bob. Now here's the thought experiment. Imagine that instead of making a money state in the way we just described, Alice generates n EPR pairs two n qubits. She sends half of each pair to Bob, and then she measures her halves in the theta bases, where theta is chosen uniformly at random, as before. So theta bases just means Hadamard basis if theta sub i is one, and standard basis if theta sub i is zero. So hopefully it's easy to see that this measurement causes the joint EPR pairs that Alice and Bob share to collapse to two copies of the money state, dollar sub x theta. Where x is uniformly random, it comes from the quantum measurement, um, and theta is the string that Alice chose uniformly around it. So far, we've basically just described an alternative way for Alice to generate the dollar state and send it to Bob. But now remember, we had this protocol where Alice sends a uniformly random challenge, C, to Bob, and Bob measures his state in the C basis and tells Alice his measurement outcomes. So here's the important part. Note that if Bob passes in this protocol, i.e. he tells Alice the correct outcomes, um, he recovers a subset of the string X, so this one. Um, which Alice, in this thought experiment, obtained through a measurement on her halves of, of the EPR pairs. So it turns out that correlations like these between Alice and Bob um, are a test for entanglement. What do I mean by that? So there's a theorem from Natarajan and Vidic, uh, 2016, which says that um, if Bob and Alice exhibit correlations like they do in the thought experiment that we were just considering, 
Then they once shared EPR pairs up to local isometry. So local isometry just means that um, if you have some EPR pairs, it means that they might you can apply local reversible quantum operations um, on Alice's halves. This is Alice, or on Bob's halves. This is Bob. Um, but nothing that's you know applied to the whole state um, globally. So on both halves simultaneously. And so for Alice, the map on her side, um, this is just the identity, since Alice is honest and she didn't do anything to her halves of the EPR pairs after she sent them to Bob. Uh, for Bob, uh, we can efficiently apply the isometry given black box controlled versions of Bob's unitaries, which is exactly the condition that the extraction um, definition gives us. This is all from the theorem. Okay, so what's the point of that? The point is that we have an argument now for extraction. So firstly, we argue that the thought experiment and the real protocol are actually indistinguishable to Bob, which means he must behave the same way um, in both. So that the two protocols are indistinguishable should be obvious if Alice measures her halves of the EPR pairs temporarily before Bob measures them, since in that case the two protocols, um, the imaginary one and the real one, are actually equivalent and we just described a different way for Alice to generate the doll state and send it to Bob. But even if she me measures temporarily after Bob does, he, he still can't tell between the thought experiment and the real protocol because local operations on EPR pairs commute. So we can just commute Alice's measurement past Bob's measurement and then we're good to go. The second main point, um, this is the theorem that we get from Natarajan and Vidic, is that if Bob passes in the proof of knowledge protocol in the thought experiment world, then there is a local isometry, phi b, on his side, um, such that this equation holds, where psi a b is the initial joint state of Alice and Bob in the thought experiment world. That's after Alice sent Bob the EPR pairs, but before either Alice or Bob measured them. So the intuition is that in the thought experiment world, Alice sent half EPR pairs to Bob instead of a money state, and then Bob might have decided to apply some map to his side of the EPR pairs after receiving them. And the theorem from Natarajan and Vidic 2016 just says that there is a phi b um, which can recover the EPR pairs, regardless of what Bob might have done to his side, um, pr provided that he was able to pass with high probability in the proof of knowledge protocol. So basically saying if Bob passes, we can more or less figure out exactly what his strategy was. Okay, so now here's a technical calculation, which I am going to skip over, but the punchline basically is uh, this. Um, you might have been wondering on the previous slide, okay, uh, this one, okay, in the ideal world, the thought experiment world, if we apply this phi b um, to Bob's side, we recover EPR pairs. But what is the point of recovering EPR pairs in the ideal world? We want to recover the money state in the real world. And this is just a computation which shows that uh, shows how the two are connected, basically. Um, from this computation, we can deduce that if we apply the same phi b um, to the initial joint state of Alice and Bob in the real protocol, uh, then we'll recover on Bob's side the money state, tensored with maybe some auxiliary state on Bob's private register. And this will be the money state on Bob's side will be in the message register. So the extractor's strategy is simply to apply phi b um, to Bob's side using the black box access to Bob that it's given, and then return the state in the message register, and that's it. OK, so now I'll just quickly go through two other examples which we also showed are classical proofs of quantum knowledge. So one of them is another quantum money scheme. Um, our proof strategy for the Wiesn states, as you, you have seen, is, is quite specific to the structure of that particular protocol, but we are able to apply it to one more example. So the example is a modification of a different quantum money scheme, which is based on these subspace states proposed by Aronson and Cristiano in 2012. And since the technique worked pretty nicely for the Wiesn scheme, the main difficulty here with these different states is to massage them to make them look enough like the Wiesner scheme to be able to apply the technique. So we don't exactly do it for subspace states, but we do it for what we call one-time padded subspace states. The third example which we analyze is the celebrated Mahadev verification protocol for verifying quantum computations. So we show that this is an argument of quantum knowledge for QMA relations. That just means that the soundness only holds against computationally bounded proofs, just like the original Mahadev protocol. So Mahadev's original analysis uh, showed that a computationally bounded prover who passes in her protocol guarantees 
that a witness exists satisfying some cure mate relation. And we show that the witness can be extracted from the prover in a black box fashion. And the proof uses technical components that essentially already existed in the Mahadev protocol, and we just make the claim explicit. All right, so that's all I would like to say today. Thank you. And if there are any questions, please feel free to reach out or to ask me at the question session.